Here we are on the Confederate side of Iverson's Pits, Iverson's attack on July 1st, 1863, and I'd like to read from you uh, something written by Captain Lewis T. Hicks, Company E of the 20th North Carolina Infantry, about that attack. And so we are looking towards the Union line. Uh, the 11th Pennsylvania is straight across the field from us right now. And Captain Hicks writes, The carnage to my company was great. We carried 300 in action. Result of two and one half hours battle forced us to surrender. And only 62 men out of the 300 left. A little ravine in the hillside saved this number. In the absence of white flags, the wounded men hoisted their boots and hats on their bayonets to show their desperation. The smoke was so dense you could not perceive an object ten feet from you. The awful gloom of this moment is beyond the description, the description of pen. While we felt and heard the tread of the enemy, our minds were in a tumult, whether to lie still, or to yield, or to die fighting. John F. Coghill of the 23rd North Carolina uh, wrote to his parents on July 9th, 1863 about, I regret to tell you that Ryle Stewart was killed after he was taken prisoner. The Yankees took the best part of our regiment in brigade, and while they was carrying them on to the rear, we had another line of battle marched up and shot a volley into the Yanks and the prisoners, and a ball hit Ryle in the side. The ball went in one side and came out the other, he did live some four or five hours after he was struck. He was in his right mind until he died. Some of our boys stayed with him until he died. I never saw him no more after he went into the fight. I loved Ryle as a brother, and I would do anything that I could for him. He was a brave and noble young man, but alas, he has fallen in the cause of his beloved country. Our loss is awful. Alfred Iverson was a Georgian, and he found himself in command of North Carolinian troops on July 1st, 1863. Up there is Oak Hill and the Peace Memorial, and that's where Iverson's attack would have jumped off. It's been purported that Iverson was a bit sauced uh, from, uh, they were at the Carlisle Barracks the night before, had a little bit to drink. He may or may not have been drunk, but it is known that he definitely stayed behind and not did not come with his men as they jumped off their attack. Their left flank would have been on the Mummetsburg Road, that fence over there, and Iverson's troops would have come across this field taking terrible fire. At this point, I don't know how you keep going. There are Yankee troops up along that road behind that fence and that tree line over there. And there is just no place to go, no place to hide right here. But if you keep pushing forward, and Iverson's men did, you reach that little swale. And at least you're afforded a little bit of protection. Uh, but to move on against that fire is certain death. And, and Iverson's men could go no further. Those who didn't die surrendered any way that they could. Because again, there was just no place. The Yankees counterattacked and took more prisoners. Uh, those who could escape, you know, under the smoke did. Iverson, up on his little perch on Oak Hill, uh, said he was ashamed of his men. He called them cowards for lying down in their perfect little rows boots to boots, not knowing that that's how they had fallen. Uh, Robert E. Lee uh, was not a fan of Iverson's uh, and did send him away from his army. The Yankees over across the field, the 11th Corps, the 1st Corps, were eventually flanked and retreated back into town. This is Iverson's pits. Uh, they buried the Confederate troops uh, in trenches after the battle. And as that ground sunk, it formed pits. This is purported to be 
the most haunted place in America. Uh, and at night you can see lights, flags of the Confederates in that swale across that field trying to surrender. Anyway, this is Iverson's Pits. A horrible, terrible place to be on July 1st, 1863.